Um, welcome and thank you for coming to today's webinar. My name is Sean Hibbets and I'm with Intech Anchoring Systems. Today we're going to be covering soil nails, soil nails and screws. And the intent of today's presentation isn't, you know, to be able to take this content and go be able to design a wall in its entirety. It's, it's more to familiarize everybody with the design process, conceptual things of that nature and, and steps for how a soil screw or, or a soil nail makes it into the ground and how it works. So here's an outline of the topics we're gonna cover today. Um, generally gonna be 50 minutes with about 10 minutes at the end for questions. Um, usually I'm, I'm pretty good about timing. So uh, today I'm, I'm gonna do a little quick introduction. I'm not gonna go through everybody that we have, just kind of some of the common faces with names, names and faces, so that when you're talking to us, you know uh, what we look like, who we are. Uh, so I'm Sean Hibbets. I'm on the left side of this screen. Uh, I'm a civil engineer, generally a geotechnical engineer. Uh, through practice and um, master's level with a PE. I'm registered in Missouri. And then we have Sam Pappas on the right. He's our other civil engineer. He's master's level with a PE. Just got those. So congratulations, Sam. Really proud of you. Uh, these are We're the two main points of contact for engineering that would be handling things like quoting, estimating, you know, problem, problem solving, troubleshooting and designing when you guys lean on us for that. So uh, then we have our sales team. We have uh, Bill Sears is the national sales manager at the top. And he has uh, with him Joe Camper, Adam Cox and Mark Thompson leading the charge for the steel side and in, in their respective territories. So you can see, you know, upper Midwest, Ohio Valley inside sales. So if you if you don't know who to call, uh, call Bill and he'll uh, sequence you into the right sales manager that would be in your territory. And uh, if you guys have any questions about materials, equipment, or even some technical things, you know, these guys are a great resource. And they're also, you know, networking with engineers and different people like that. So even if they can't answer the question or we can't answer the question, we can, we can help find the answer for you. So I also left... Uh, our contact information below if you wanted to get a hold of uh, one of us as the heads of engineering sales or operations. Uh, we're also located in uh, Caseyville and Livonia, which is pretty much St. Louis and Detroit. Um, that's our that's our main two locations for now. And then we have uh, a family of brands. So one of our one of our things is we're not just a one you know one solution provider. Uh, we try to be kind of a one-stop shop and be able to provide a full array of solutions that can help you, you know, install underpinning, tiebacks. Uh, we also have some foundation repair and drainage systems as well. So if you have a need for those, feel free to reach out to us at any time. So now I'm going to let uh, Chris do a little introduction for himself. Uh, he's going to be presenting on the geotechnical exploration phase in a little bit. So uh, Chris, you want to kind of tell us about yourself and your company? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sean. Um, my name is Chris Matthews. I am a uh, geotechnical engineer. Um, been practicing in the St. Louis area for uh, over a decade now. Um, I work with Bacon Farmer Workman Engineering and Testing. We are a uh, multidiscipline, full service engineering firm. Um, we're, our headquarters are in Paducah, Kentucky, but we've got about a dozen offices throughout Kentucky, Tennessee, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. Um, I'm in, like I said, I'm in our St. Louis office. I'm our branch manager here. Um, and I'm a geotech by trade. Kind of do a little bit of project management, a little bit of everything. Um, a couple areas I specialize in is doing some site-specific seismic analysis, some non-destructive in-situ foundation testing, um, and mine some sites mitigation. So cool. just, uh, and then as a, as a company, um, we kind of, service uh, transportation we do a lot of transportation work we do vertical buildings a lot of site development things like that so yeah so we have a lot of experience with geotechnical explorations which is kind of what chris is going to get into in a little bit uh for this presentation so um thank you for that and uh i'm gonna real quick get into some general concept overview type things for soil nail walls um so 
the first question is, you know, why do we need earth retention? And here you can see I've drawn some sort of a, you know, slope grade change. It's, it's a vertical cut in this instance. You got one side is higher than the other. And so, you know, over time, you know, unrestrained soils will find its own natural geometry. And, and that's one of the main problems, you know, even with a, a steep batter, if you had some sort of structure at the bottom of your slope or even people walking on the bottom of your slope, eventually it's going to find its own natural geometry, which can be problematic. And in some cases it can be very problematic, which is obviously not a condition you want your home to be in or, you know, people walking around on a project that you designed. You don't want that. So as a geotechnical engineers, you know, we can collect all this information and we can model a soil profile geometry and determine, we could have determined that that soil was going to fall apart. Or even if it was a, a steep slope, you know, we can go through and find the geometry and the soil strength characteristics, water saturation, and we can determine if, if that slope is going to be stable or not. And so one of the designs that a geotechnical engineer might do is an earth retention design. And in this case, maybe it's necessary or substantially beneficial to have a totally vertical cut. You know, maybe you don't have room on your property to build a structure unless you have a totally vertical cut. And so in that case, you know, that's when you get a geotechnical engineer because there really aren't any soils really that will hold themselves up in a vertical cut. So you got to do something. And there's a there's a number of different types of designable walls and you know you can have pros and cons for every you know different set and today we're going to talk about specifically the pros and cons and and you know favorable conditions for when to use soil nails or soil screws and so um, another common discussion point that i i tend to have is you know these elements are typically misrepresented to be tiebacks. So somebody says soil screws, somebody says soil nails, somebody says tiebacks. Everybody always thinks that they're tiebacks. And that's one of the main things that I hope that, you know, if you leave today having learned anything is that soil nails and soil screws are not the same thing as tiebacks. And I think most, most people understand tiebacks. You know, you're reaching behind the wall, you're anchoring some distance into some competent soil that you find, and you use that anchorage to actively pull back that wall, you know, that sheet pile wall or that soldier pile wall. And I think that intuitively makes sense to most people. You know, that's an active, you know, system. That's an active anchorage that pulls on the wall over its entire design life to hold the, the soil back. And so the difference between that and what a soil screw or a soil nail wall is, is that it's a passive system. It actually requires, for a, for a passive system, it requires that the soils relax to engage the soils or to engage the elements when installed, and then that won't fall apart over time. And so I'm going to go through here a little bit of a you know logical progression to maybe help you all develop some int intuitiveness on what a passive system is really doing. So... Here I've drawn that same cut. And so let's pretend that that cut slope is totally vertical and we place some block of concrete in front of it. And you can see, you know, it's just sitting there at the bottom of the cut slope and it's gonna be impacted by that, you know, soil finding its natural geometry like we talked about before when they relax or start to fail. And so, you know, you can see that that block of concrete is pretty narrow in the context of stability. So it's probably gonna be pretty easy for that, you know, force of that soil wedge behind it to knock it over. And, you know, this is an oversimplification of all the loads and moments and resistances that are actually gonna happen, but this is just, you know, a very, very, you know, it's a simplification of what's going on. But you can see that big arrow is easily gonna push over, knock over that concrete block, you know? So what do we do about that? you know, let's put a bigger block there. And so say that block is, you know, wide enough and that block is heavy enough so that that soil behind it won't knock it over. It won't be able to push it, you know, slide it over because it's so big. And so you can think about it in that context and design that. I think that's pretty intuitive. And, and 
barring any changed conditions, you know, that uh, concrete block is going to be quote unquote stable. And so why can't we do that with a block, a block of soil? So we can design a block of soil, you know, maybe it's a little bit lighter than, than that concrete block, but maybe it just needs to be a bit wider to have the weight. And so we de can design that same, you know, scenario with a block of soil. And all we have to do is figure out how do we keep that block of soil from falling apart over time under its own weight? Because for the same reason that cut slope won't be stable, that block of soil also won't be stable. So you just nail it, you nail it together. And so basically what our elements are doing for nails or screws is creating that internally reinforced block of soil that won't get pushed over, that won't, you know, be slid and it'll be stable over time. And so, you know, there's other checks that go on to, you know, model pull out and, you know, all of the different structural resistances and stuff like that. But that's, this is the core concept of what we're trying to accomplish with a passive retaining wall system. So here's some benefits um, of using a passive system over tiebacks, and I'm not going to go through all of them. And it doesn't mean that you know soil screws or nails are better than tiebacks or vice versa. And really, really, what this slide hopefully will communicate, or what I'm going to say is I'm trying to communicate is you know it's really really situational whether you can or want to use a soil wall or screw. And the biggest thing for it is you know. There's going to be some deflection characteristics that you might be worried about. There might be some right of way restrictions that you worry about. Um, and there might be, you know, elements for tiebacks are 50, 60, 70 feet versus 20 to 30 feet for a soil nail or a soil screw. And you can manage, you know, lengths and spacings to try and reduce reduce loads per tieback and stuff like that. But eventually it might just be beneficial to switch to a soil nail wall design. And so uh, I'll talk about it a little bit later on, but you know, a soil nail or soil screw wall will be will have elements that are about 70% to 100% times the wall height. So a 30 foot tall soil nail wall might only have 20 to 30 foot long elements, whereas a tie back might have that 70 foot long element that makes it geotechnically or structurally problematic. Um, so this is also a big table, you know, I'm gonna, Put this out as a, a handout whenever you know whenever i get everybody's contact information settled I'll, I'll send the slide deck so you guys will have this but it's also in the fhwa manual uh, for soil nails which i'll also hand out but um this is just kind of the the high level headings of all of the different favorable and non-favorable conditions these are generalized it doesn't mean that if you know you have a non-favorable soil condition that it won't work you know, a soil nail or soil screw wall might work in some of these non-favorable conditions, but, you know, you just have to assess it. And there's a lot more, you know, intense discussions and, you know, uh, commentary within the manual that you really should, you know, if you're going to design one of these, sit down and, and really get into. So the, uh, the gist of it is, you know, to have a soil that's favorable for a soil nail or soil screw wall is a soil that's going to stand up. Uh, you know, for a little bit of a cut over a moderate timeline, maybe a day or two, to allow for you to install a full row of facing and elements in your first cut, and then be able to stand up, you know, for the next cut, maybe, maybe it's two foot for the first cut, and then five foot for the second cut, it's just got to be able to, you know, be stabilized, otherwise, you're gonna uh, be destabilized over that couple days, and it's not gonna, it's not gonna work out too well, constructability wise. And so, you know, better clays, partially cemented sands with some apparent cohesion, engineered fills and stuff like that. Those are those are typically pretty uh, favorable, favorable scenarios. Um, some common unfavorable scenarios would be, you know, having granular soils with groundwater, you know, soft soils near the bottom of the of the wall and sensitive soils. Anything that really causes problems with the facing of the soils sloughing off and destabilizing between lifts, it just makes it to where you have to keep digging back and back and back and it just makes it uh, unreasonable to use a soil screw or passive system at that point. So I've kind of talked about soil nails and soil screws 
and just wanted to kind of um, real quick hit what the difference is. So on the left, you can see soil nails are a micro pile type of element. Um, they're battered, you know, 15 degrees or so. Typically a four to six inch diameter grout column with steel reinforcing in the middle. And we have uh, our brand of hollow bar micro piles, which is just a, a special type of micro pile is called MagnaCore. And we're able to install our elements without casing, which can be advantageous in collapsible soils where maybe for a traditional solid bar micro pile, you have to do a cased installation and pull your casing out. Um, and then on the right, soil screws are, you know, a many flighted helical pile, basically, that's screwed into the ground and engages that soil mass to create the internally reinforced block of soil. And they're typically uh, inch and a quarter to inch and a half bar with six, eight, six inch to eight inch helical flights on them. So those are the screws versus nails. Both of those are a passive system and they'll accomplish generally the same the same thing. And there will be a handout at handouts at the end of this. One is the FHWA soil nail manual. And then I'll also send you the chance uh, soil screw manual, which goes through the design methodology as well. So then uh, it's important to talk through, you know, the construction of these. Uh, namely, it's a, it's a top down construction. So here you can see we have a soil block and you've got soil that's going to be removed. Um, basically, you are going to start with your initial excavation down to your first row of anchors. You're going to install your nail or your screw. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into each of the installation of them. You know, a screw gets screwed into the ground. A nail is drilled into the ground, generally speaking. Um, we do have other uh, webinars and different videos that go through the installation of our elements. So if you have interest in that, let me know. So then uh, you have your first row of elements installed all the way down the length of your wall and behind it you're coming in with wire mesh and your shot creating for your initial facing and you're terminating everything with a plate and a nut and there's a uh, other different components in there I'll get into in a little bit but um, so after, after everything's kind of cured a little bit, you're going to excavate your next row, uh, of anchors to expose it and then install your next row of anchors. And, you know, everything's being shot created and meshed, uh, to, to keep those near face soils from sloughing off as you go. And that's repeated until the entire set of nails or screws are installed for the entire length of wall. And so, uh, so that's basically it. You know, there's there's other other parts and steps, you know, drainage and, and things like that that go into the construction of these. I'm not going to get into the the manual gets into it really in depth. So if you're going to design some of these, make sure that you really go through the manual. And so here's some bullet points for uh, nails, typically, you know, four inch, six inch grouted micro piles and some sort of steel reinforcing uh, solid bar micro piles are going to be a continuous threaded bar um, coupled as you go. You know, you can uh, basically drill the hole out. Usually you have to advance casing with these and drill the hole as you go. And then you set your rebar with centralizers and then you trim and grout uh, the element on the way out. Uh, hollow bar is our specialized type of micro pile that we have uh, the steel for. Uh, and it's a one pass installation. Basically you're, you're grouting as you install the element. Once you've completed the depth that you need to get to, you disconnect from the drill and you're done. You terminate it and you shot create it like normal, but, um, you don't have to trip into the hole with casing and trip out of the hole and do multiple phases of grouting and all that. You just, you go in and you're done. So, uh, for soil nails, one of the things is installation doesn't really provide you any you know empirical data or relationship for capacity so it's going to require load testing and, and proof testing uh, which you have to wait for things to cure and you gotta you know have everything kind of lined up and it's kind of awkward to load test at an angle sometimes if you don't have very competent soils right below so 
can be it can be challenging, uh, but it's definitely doable. And uh, they're they're also um, regardless of whether they're the wall is going to be a temporary or permanent wall, they're typically left in place. You know, if you if you have to dig it out, it's it's a little problematic. Yeah. People do it for sure. Um, it's not uncommon to to pull them out if it's required, but um, they're typically left in place. Um, so, and then also for the grout, you're going to need to, you know, wait for it to set up before you can test anything. Um, soil screws, typically inch and a quarter to one and a half inch square shaft helicals. Uh, typically six inch or eight inch flights are nearly continuous along the whole length of the helicals. And you're, when, when these are installed, um, it's usually required to measure torque versus penetration length. And that torque is generally related to the tensile capacity of these elements. So um, generally, if, if you have a stiffer soil, that you're going to have more torque. So that kind of follows that if you're measuring the torque, you can back out to see what the strength characteristics of the soils are. And so that's really covered in the soil screw manual, which I'll give you guys. But um, it's also possible uh to unscrew these elements from the ground uh which is a lot easier than trying to pull a micro pile out of the ground or something that's grouted um it might require some you know partial demolition if the facing is shotcrete uh, but it's also possible to you know plan ahead and utilize some temporary facings like precast panels timber or plywood uh if you can make it work and pull that off and then re uh, remove and reuse screw piles on another installation on another job even. So uh, Chance has some guidance that they've given me that I'll, I'll send to you guys. But basically, if you haven't yielded anything and you haven't really gotten to um, any twist or, or anything like that, you can, you can reuse these soil screws on multiple installations um, without any problem. And so if you have temporary walls that you're doing and you know, it's a domestic material, and if it's like a federal federal job or something like that, that might be a good option for you. And also, there's uh, no grout for these elements, so you know, once you're in the ground and you've done your proof test or whatever, they're they're ready to go. So, um, just a disclaimer. Obviously, I don't I don't think any of you are going to be able to uh, design a soil screw wall off of what's contained in this presentation. Uh, if if you could, you're a magician because there's definitely not enough information to be able to, you know, do all the calculations required. But uh, this is this is just a conceptual uh, presentation that should give you the talking points as a contractor to understand what maybe the engineers are saying. Uh, but as an engineer, maybe a new engineer, this would be a useful presentation to be able to to have those talking points as well. So. Now I'm going to kick it over to uh, Chris Matthews for his part of the presentation for information required for wall design. So, uh, Chris, if you want to take it over, have at it. Yeah, sure. So the goal of this part of the presentation really is just to run you guys through um, kind of as a geotech engineer what what I'm looking to accomplish during the subsurface exploration uh, when we're we're designing soil nail walls. So there's got kind of five things you really need to know to determine your design. Um, two of them are kind of out of the hands of a geotechnical engineer, the slope geometry and the external loading conditions. Um, you know, that slope geometry is dependent on your site conditions, what your existing topography is, um, what your construction sequencing is, and, and what your final grade is going to look like, what kind of grade change you're trying to accomplish with your wall. And then external loading conditions is things like um, traffic loads, building loads, um, any kind of other structures, things like that. Um, so the three things that we're really looking at is What's the geometry of your soil layers? Um, what's the strength of those soils? And then also a really important thing is um, where groundwater is at on your site. And so to um, determine all those things, we're going to conduct geotechnical exploration. And um, so we're trying to determine the two-dimensional, three-dimensional soil stratigraphy. Um, and that's done through borings um, or some other exploration techniques. And typically, we conduct borings um, to a depth of H which is the height of your wall, below the bottom of the wall. Um, typically spacings are in the order of one to 200 feet. And we would want to collect samples within the profile, um, both behind and underneath the wall, um, to start determining the properties of those soils. And 
the determine the soil strength parameters, which can be done a handful of ways. Um, they range in complexity from the SPT or standard penetration test, which is basically where you're using a automatic hammer um, to drive a, a thick walled sampler into the ground and collect a sample. And it kind of gives you a rough approximation of soil stiffness. Um, this test has been around forever. There's a thousand different um, parameters you can derive from the SPT just because there's such a vast uh, knowledge base of experience with it. Um, but it is kind of a rudimentary test. Um, it gives you a disturbed sample. You can't really do any strength testing in a lab with that sample. Um, you can do CPT soundings, which gives you a continuous profile of your soil stratigraphy. Um, you don't actually collect any samples, but you're measuring the in strength or in situ strength of your soils. Um, it pushes a cone into the ground that has load cells on it. That's measuring how that the, the amount of force is being required to advance that cone through the soil. Um, then you can also do things such as uh, vein shear test, pressure meter test, or uh, flat blade dilatometer test. Um, those are pretty technical, pretty complicated, advanced tests, pretty expensive. Um, will probably only be done in special cases where you've got some really problematic soils or some pretty complex uh, wall geometry or tall wall heights. Um, and then also when we would drill borings, we could collect undisturbed samples with Shelby tubes, um, which are then taken back to the lab to um, perform strength testing on in the lab. And then the other important thing is saturation groundwater. Um, very important, you know, ground groundwater is going to, if it's present, it's going to put more load on your wall um, that you have to account for in design. Um, and we can determine the groundwater level either through CPT soundings or borings. Um, and then if we need to know if there's seasonal changes in groundwater, if that's important to design, we could also install piezometers to determine um, any fluctuations in groundwater over time. Um, so if you're looking at the FHWA manual, um, they kind of outline what, a, what they would like to see, you know, what we would call a great geotechnical exploration, um, kind of goes above, kind of really goes above and beyond what you would see sometimes and gives you a lot of information to really design, do a good wall design. So you would want to see borings uh, at the front and back side of the wall. Uh, behind the wall, you want to do them around 150 foot on center and then extend them to um, anywhere from one to two H below the final grades, depending on your, your wall heights. And then in the front of the wall, we're looking at 200 foot on center um, and anywhere from three quarters to one times your wall height. And if we know we're going to have problematic soils, um, very soft soils, organic soils, or if you're in an area of high seismicity, um, you might want to extend these depth deeper than what's outlined here. Yeah, you got to love it when somebody stops a boring on a, a two blow count material at, you know, the bottom of their, at the bottom of their boring with no information below it. Yeah, you probably want to keep going if you got soft soils. So. Yeah. <laughs> so really, you know, you can predetermine your depths. You know, sitting in the office when you're typing up what you want the driller to do, but really you need to have some feedback of what's going on in the field while you're drilling to make sure you're you're collecting all the information you need in the design. Exactly. Uh, so let's just like a schematic diagram here of what kind of where you would want your borings. You want something in front of the wall, something behind the wall, and if you really you know really need to get something even further back to the wall if you're looking at real tall wall heights. Here's plan view, kind of what I outlined with the uh, spacings and the depths. Um, and so the, the goal of all of this is to determine the strength of the soils that are going to be um, involved in the, in the wall. What, what you're really looking at two things. You're looking at the local stability of the wall, which is shown here. And the, the local stability is really talking about the area that is within that block of reinforced soils. So you're going to need to know the strength of those soils to look at the things like uh, the, the pullout resistance of the nails or the, the bearing available to the, uh, the helicals. And so you would want samples in that block, but then you also need information of the foundation soils underneath that block to check bearing capacity, sliding, things like that of the um, of that block. And then we also need to check the global stability, um, kind of what you would look at, like stability of a slope as well. You're looking at failure planes where you would get like a rotational failure of that entire uh, block of soils there. So you need to define the strength of those soils along and the properties of those soils along that interface there. So we would want to drill, collect soil samples, or do testing in those areas to start determining the strengths. Um, and if you look at that area of excavated soils, probably not as important to collect information there because those soils are going to be um, excavated. So it's you know that's not as important. We would probably still collect so, um, 
collect disturbed samples there, but you're not going to do any kind of strength testing on that material. Then after we collect our samples, we're going to take them back to the lab and we're going to run a series of, of lab tests on them. I see a question real quick. Uh, I'll get to this later. Um, so we're going to do lab testing. We're going to determine moisture content, um, density, uh, the gradation or the grain size of the soil. And then we're, the, really the important thing is the shear strength testing. Um, so you can perform either whether you're looking for short term or long term um, strength. You perform a series of unconsolidated, undrained test, unconfined compression test, um, consolidated, undrained triaxial testing. Um, really, that's all under the kind of the geotechnical engineer is going to going to define what kind of testing they're going to do on the soils to determine the strengths. And then you can also do things like uh, deformability and modulus testing. Um, typically, those aren't done only, only in um, you know pretty complex situations with problematic soils. And so once we get all this information, we complete the subsurface exploration, we complete the lab testing, then as a geotech engineer, we can sit down and look, okay, here's where what your soil stratigraphy is. Um, you know, here's your, your layering your soils, and then start to define properties to each layer, um, whether your soil strengths, your densities, things like that, and then also determine what your groundwater level is. And then we can use that information to start looking at the soil bond strength, um, for the nails and then any kind of ultimate barriers is not needed for the screws. You can see here's just got a quick schematic showing um, on the left hand side there you've got a, a soil nail and you can see that you know that that pull out resistance basically that soil nail that bond strength along the length of the nail is what we're looking to define from a geotechnical perspective on the design of the nails and then on the right hand side for the screws um, you're looking at what the bearing resistance is of those screws on the soil. Yeah. That I will hand it back over to Sean and let him wrap things up here. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that. And uh, you definitely have a lot of experience, got a decade now. It's kind of weird. Chris and I went to school together and uh, it's kind of weird saying that we have that much experience at this point, <laughs> but we do. So uh, now I'm gonna go through some general dimensions and geometry for wall layouts, and then we're gonna wrap it up with uh, stability checks. So this slide represents some wall layout rules of thumb for designers from the FHWA nail manual. They're not set in stone and uh, it's generally a, a good place to uh, be within, good ranges to be within for designers. And I won't go into these too much, but typically we're looking to tackle about, you know, 20 to 35 square feet of elevation view wall area per element. So if you think about that in the context of tiebacks, you know, typically we're going to have you know, a good number more soil nail elements or soil screw elements than a tieback wall would. Uh, but we should be making up for that in terms of the reinforcing size and pile length and pile diameter uh, because the loads maybe will be a little less. Uh, and we're also for this system, we're not installing, you know, a soldier pile wall with lagging and sheet pile wall. Um, so there's it's just a little bit different and, uh, you know, depending on what the site and project characteristics are, you know, it'll, it'll walk into whether it's a good uh, fit for the project or not, but those are some things to consider. So a couple other bullet points that I thought were important from the FHWA manual are on this slide. Uh, first, a wall batter might be beneficial if you have the room. Uh, this can help with less pile section being required. Uh, it might reduce the nail length required by around 10 to 15 percent. However, it's also going to increase the area of the wall a little bit. Um, so there's going to be a balancing point where that benefit might be, you know, outweighed by the area increase and maybe having to do a few more elements from that. So um, also, you know, it's easy to design off of one perfect slice of a wall like I have, you know, so far in this presentation. Um, and, uh, so it's, uh, easy to design off of that, but, you know, when you get out into the field, you know, in construction, you're going to hit, you're going to find utilities, you're going to find existing structures, you're going to, you know, have to adjust different things like the length or batter or splay for field conditions. So you want to take that into account in your design, you know, if you have an understanding of all of the different structures that you might encounter and you, where utilities are, that, that those are important things to consider when you're designing and make sure that 
you know what you're going to do ahead of time so that you're not, you know, scrambling in the field with, you know, a cut slope for more days than you really wanted to. So uh, that that's something to make sure that you're accounting for. And then uh, also, you know, minimum spacing requirements um, are important because you don't want to have overlapping stresses, to, which could overstress the soils internally or externally for pullout. Um, so minimum three, three and a half foot spacing should be kind of specified so you don't have that to worry about. Um, also, it's really important to not install above existing utilities. Uh, for one, you know, if, if later on they have to do any sort of maintenance on the utility, they might destabilize the wall. Uh, most of the loads are going to be concentrated. Most of the higher loads are going to be concentrated in the upper depths of the walls. So if they're, you know, excavating below a nail that that might destabilize that section of the wall, which could be uh, problematic. And, and plus, you know, also with grouted elements, it's possible that if you install above a utility and you have, you know, a profile that allows grout to kind of penetrate into the soils, you could actually grout your utility up, which could be problematic, obviously. So um, there's also another concept within the design that the lower half of the wall will typically have reduced pile lengths, even though the design comes out with, you know, a high load, these, lo these loads and lengths can actually be reduced quite a bit. Um, I don't really want to get into that for this presentation, but there's some good uh, methodology within the FHWA manual for how and when to do that. So um, here's a couple elevation views of the pile layouts. You know, you can see on the left, uh, there's a square pattern and on the right, there's a staggered pattern. And these are going to have, you know, slightly different calculations for area and, and you know, uh, stuff like that. So. Um, it's all within the FHWA manual, and, and most of the time the softwares will take care of that for you anyway. So. Uh, another concept that should be considered is corrosion protection, and generally there are three levels of corrosion protection, starting here with Class A. Uh, class A provides the most layers of protection with an inner grout or, or a corrosion inhibiting fluid. Uh, full encapsulation of the bar and that inner inner fluid, and then another outer layer of grout. So there's quite a few levels of protection, and um, you know that definitely won't shouldn't have very much problem with corrosion on the steel. So the t the second type is Class B, which consists of galvanized or epoxy coated uh, steel with the grout on the outside. Um, so we're able to accomplish that. Um, the third type is Class C, which is just grout. Uh, for soil screws, the materials are, are actually fully galvanized um, and we don't pull grout down with them, but they do offer a layer of corrosion protection for, for sure. Uh, you can also use the sacrificial steel method, you know, so if you oversized your bar and understand, you know, how much corrosion is going to happen over time, you can figure out if over your design life, are you going to have enough steel remaining to bear all of the tension loads? So, um, Honestly, in my experience with corrosion protection, uh, most of the time the corrosivity potential of the site is not really very well defined. Um, somebody might have had some issues maybe nearby and somebody, you know, a municipality is requiring class A corrosion protection or maybe it's a critical uh, structure or something like that. But most of the time people aren't really defining the corrosivity nature of the soil. So it's important, you know, if you want to refine that to actually define what the actual hazard is uh, with, within the geotechnical analysis. Uh, and so finally, here's the typical termination detail for nails on the left and screws on the right. And, and they're the same, you know, you have your element coming out, um, your thread bar is going to come out for your nail from the element and for a helical or for a soft screw, you're going to have an adapter that adapts to a threaded uh, condition and then you just have that coming through your bearing plate and there's going to be a washer and a nut and you have your wire mesh and initial shot creep facing and then your uh, facing is going to be held on your final facing is going to be held on to the um, studs and everything like that so uh, so now I'm going to go through and discuss the stability checks to wrap up our presentation there's generally about 10 checks that are going to go through on every design, and a lot of them happen within the software packages. 
Uh, but it's important to just generally understand what the what the software is trying to communicate um, for to the design professional. So just going to be you know high level stuff for the most part, and uh, it's not going to be intense calculations or anything like that. So the first check is for internal stability, and this is the check of the stability on slip surfaces that uh, intersect the piles themselves. So whether it's a soil screw or a soil nail, you know, you have on one side the internal stability and on the outside it's kind of a pull outside. So as long as, you know, you have an overall stability that's higher than the recommended minimum overall stability of a number of iterations of these slip surfaces, you should be good. So basically, this gets done in a software package like Snails or Gold Nail or Snap, and that software is going to iterate a bunch of uh, slip surfaces, and it'll find whatever the worst case uh, slip surface is for the nail trial um, number of nails and spacing and everything. It's going to calculate those iterations, and it's going to spit out what's the worst case factor of safety for that. And then you compare that. Um, you compare that to the required factor of safety for overall stability. And if your worst case scenario is less than say 1.5 is pretty common, then you have to go through and modify your, um, your layout a little bit, you know, uh, make it longer or change your spacing or stuff like that. And uh, you're modifying your uh, layout until your factor of safety is higher than that 1.5. And so also from this, you know, you're going to compare is your nail length, you know, greater than that, you know, 1.0, 1.2 times your wall height. And if it is, you need to modify your layout a little bit more because it's not really efficient. And uh, we're also getting the uh, T max load out of this step. So we're able to see, you know, and compare structurally and geotechnically for uh, nails and screws are, are we good with uh, design and, and we can design off of that. So the second check is the global stability. And so this is the stability of, of the soils outside of the engineered wall system. So slip surfaces that exist beyond the nails or screws. And this is usually performed, you know, with software like Stable or Slide or Plexus. And you're generally, you know, going to lean on a geotechnical engineer for this. Um, this, this is not a simple design and, and it can be complicated in term and it can be done very incorrectly very easily if you don't know what you're doing so typically this is like a, a chief engineer level review uh in my experience at least and you shouldn't just lean on a you know green kid out of college to to run a software and and just rely on that so uh, and it can have some big implications too because these slip surfaces can be very deep and very very problematic so third check uh, is going to be basal heave, ba you know, bearing capacity of the block. This is relatively uncommon based on uh, what soils are typically good, but soft cohesive soils under the uh, soil nail wall and granular soils with a groundwater table near the bottom, you know, those those can be problematic conditions. And um, Ashto has a, a methodology to check whether you should check this based on the undrained shear strength of those soils at the base. And it's, you know, 15% of that uh, density and height of the walls. Uh, so you're just checking that. And so sliding is checked, you know, for a layer of maybe sloped weak or laminated soils. If, if you have, you know, a, a failure plane that you expect to be geometrically, you know, linear at the bottom and that, that soil block could slide on, you know, you're checking that sliding resistance to see, you know, is the friction between that uh, problematic soil and your block, is that friction enough and that weight together with the friction is enough to resist sliding of the soils behind it, you know, kind of pushing on it. And so, you know, you can set up with modern slope stability programs, set up failure planes through that, you know, possible layer of weak soil and check what the factors of safety are and maybe make your, you know, soil wall a bit wider than it need, you know, originally needed to be to resist that. So then you have uh, pull out resistance and basically within all of the phases of construction all the way to final construction of the wall, the nails are gonna be undergoing stress transfer from the soils relaxing onto the elements. 
and there's going to be some additional length of element beyond that uh, internal check uh, with the critical surface. So the amount of element for soil nails behind that um, is going to be the surface area of the grout column uh, multiplied by the bond strength divided by an appropriate factor of safety. So you can see, you know, you just need to have enough grout column beyond that critical slip surface failure plane to hold everything kind of together so that you don't have your uh, nail, nail pull out geotechnically or creep out if the soils are soft uh, or have any issues like that. And then for um, hollow bar specifically, I put this table on here that has the uh, ultimate ground grout to ground bond strength values. And you can see if you inspect kind of closely, um, hollow bar elements specifically are on this right side, this type E. And you can see, you know, 9.7 to 34.7 for sands, that's in PSI, compared to 10 to 21 for a gravity grouted kind of a traditional solid bar element. So you can see that there's some increase between the two types of elements um, for hollow bar specifically, about a 50% increase on the higher end uh, if you used a hollow bar. So you're able to get a lot better engagement with the ground with hollow bar because through the installation of it, we're continuously grouting under a slight amount of pressure. So you kind of get some grout getting into the soils, uh, improving the soils a little bit, and also creating a little bit uh, larger of a diameter grout column than you would with a, a traditional drilled, cased and drilled element. So then the soil screw, for the soil screws, the capacity of the flights beyond that critical failure surface of the soil block are checked. You add it up per flight, you know, kind of in a sense distributing that uh, load into each flight. And basically these are checking that we have enough bearing capacity on each flight beyond that failure plane to not have a pullout failure. So then the sixth check is the nail intention. And so this is the strength of the bar itself. And it's pretty common. It's typically taken to be, you do the resistance of the shaft, which is the area of the shaft times its yield strength, which will be the nominal tension capacity. And then you just apply a reduction that's you know based on the methodology somewhere like 60%. And you have a design capacity for the shaft, which is then compared to your uh, load. And as long as your, resi your design resistance is more than your load, then you're good. And then uh, checks seven through 10, I'm not gonna get into, basically it's the uh, bending and punching and tensile limits of the steel of the termination and the concrete initial shotcrete facing and with the wire mesh in there. So um, these checks are, you know, uh, pretty quick and the manual goes through them uh, pretty, pretty concisely. So I'd say check that out. Uh, so those are all the, you know, stability and structural capacity checks. Um, another consideration for uh, any project really is, is the serviceability limits. So, you know, lateral displacement, um, you can see that the, you know, pattern on the, or on the right side, you can see that the uh, deformed pattern is to the left of the uh, original configuration. And so there's also a little bit of, uh, you know, settlement, vertical settlement of that soil, and it's going to basically, you know, reform itself. So if you have an existing structure that's far enough away, you know, maybe that's not a problem, but if you're really worried about, you know, those soils moving over time or anything like that, it might push you away from using a soil nail wall. You just, you just have to understand that that's an implied um, potential condition that will happen for a soil nail wall because it is that passive system and it requires that movement to engage the elements. Uh, and so on the left side, you can see there is a, uh, you know, distance for effective soil deformation behind the wall. And so you can calculate, you know, with different soil types, you know, when is it going to be a problem or not? So um, then we have other, you know, special types of considerations to make, you know, soil nail walls have performed better than gravity walls during seismic events. Um, I don't think there's too much uh, research or at least none that I encountered during my, you know, initial putting this together. Um, and just go through, you know, methodology prescribed by FHWA or ASHTO. 
you know, you got to work, you got to really, really pay attention to drainage, uh, water being impounded within the structure of the wall is for any type of wall really is, is a, uh, you know, big performance issue. Uh, if you don't take care of it, uh, water is, you know, 99% of the problems in pretty much any wall that exists. Um, so then you have other design scenarios that the manuals cover, like stepped walls, composite walls, where you have a combination sole nail wall and maybe a tie back wall at the top or MSE wall or something like that. Uh, frost can be a, an issue or concern that you got to account for. Uh, strut nails when you're having scenarios where one of your elements turns into a compression element. So there's there's some other things that, you know, the design manual really gets into that you should check out. And then uh, finally, I have this factors of safety for the wall conditions and checks, and you're just meeting those and you just got to use your own engineering judgment and understanding of what's going on and uh, what's happening with this. So you know, temporary non-critical structures can have a factor safety of 1.35, for instance. Um, but you just you just got to understand, you know, what your risk is and what what the owner, ultimate owner, is willing to accept. So.